Okay, so I think we'll begin. Thank you so much everyone for joining us today. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project Specialist at the Maxwell and Eleanor Blum Patient Family Learning Center at Mass General Hospital. And my name is Kimberly Makis. I also work at the Maxwell and Eleanor Blum Patient Family Learning Center as a health educator. Thank you. Before we get started, just wanted to go over a few items with you all. Please note that today's session is being recorded for educational purposes. If you're interested in viewing the recording, you may visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Please note that everyone is in listen only mode. Everyone has been muted so that we can hear our guest speaker today. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, feel free to use the chat feature, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We'll have time for them in the end. Only Blum Center staff and the guest speaker will see your questions. Please do not share any personal medical information or questions in the chat box. If you have a personal medical question, please ask a doctor. So next, I would like to introduce you all to Sharon Gallagher. Sharon has been a nurse practitioner since 2001. She started her career caring for general cardiovascular patients on an inpatient team at Brigham Women's Hospital. In 2005, Sharon transitioned her work to an inpatient cardiovascular team at Mass General. In 2016, she joined the Adult Congenital Heart Disease Program at Mass General. She joins us today to give a talk on exercise for adults with congenital heart disease. So please join me in welcoming Sharon. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here today and I appreciate the opportunity. I'm just gonna go ahead and share my presentation. Okay, so my name is Sharon Gallagher and I'm a nurse practitioner on the adult congenital heart disease team here at Mass General Hospital. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about exercise and congenital heart disease. Um, many of you who know me know that exercise has long been a passion of mine. So I'm really happy to, to share some, uh, some thoughts on this topic with you today. I first wanna thank the Heartfelt Dreams Foundation for their support of this educational series. They are a foundation that um, provides uh, many things for, for our patients um, and, and all patients with congenital heart disease. We're very grateful for their support. Um, they help with anything from emotional support and counseling to patients, um, financial assistance, getting patients to uh, appointments or uh, providing hotel accommodations. We have many patients that come from Western Mass, uh, New York, upstate New York, uh, Vermont. So we really appreciate their help getting patients uh, where they need to be so they can be evaluated. They provide education to all medical providers and they also have the scholarship, the Heartfelt Dreams Foundation Nursing Scholarship. So definitely check out their website. They've been um, quite supportive of our program and we're very, we're very grateful. So the purpose of what I would like to do for, for the talk today is talk about exercise guidelines in the general population and then transition to exercise guidelines and the challenges in the adult congenital heart disease population and provide some patient examples of how we can implement this. So it's, it's well established that regular physical activity is important in preventing many health problems, particularly in our population, diabetes, heart attacks, and strokes. We also know that it has very positive, um, positive outcomes for mental health as well. But unfortunately, when we talk about the, the general adult population in the United States, only 50% of those, those um, adults exercise. And we as providers have a very important role in this. And when we talk about exercise, we first usually focus on aerobic exercise. And just to give a little, um, review of that. This is exercise where we use oxygen to produce energy. This type of exercise has various levels of intensity and we can sustain it for a longer period of time. So we may more commonly think about running, walking, biking, or swimming. And this exercise improves cardiovascular conditioning or, or endurance. And 
it does this in, in three ways. It increases, it increases the efficiency of our respiration, so our breathing. It increases the amount of blood pumped from the left ventricle with each contraction, and it improves blood volume distribution and delivery to muscles. So really, um, you know, better exchange of oxygen with respiration and, and carbon dioxide and, and getting blood where it needs to be in a, a very efficient manner. We can also talk about anaerobic exercise and this um, uses stored energy sources. And this is usually exercise that you sustain for shorter intervals because it's very high intensity. For example, you know, a HIIT class, a high intensity interval class. And this can really build muscle. And then we can talk about strength training, also known as resist resistance training. And this is can be, this is exercise that could be using either exercise resistance bands. I know Tom Brady is a big fan of that, or um, weights. But we do always advise our patients, um, and this is general cardiology as well, that we typically prefer lighter weights and more repetitions just because of um, the blood pressure fluctuations you can have with really heavy weights. And then stretching flexibility and balance, which we really won't talk about as much today, but just to be um, inclusive in, in talking about the exercise. And this is a slide that I really enjoy. And it says, the handle on your recliner does not qualify as an exercise machine. And I, I put this here because I think it's very important whenever I ask a patient what they're doing for exercise, many patients don't have a dedicated exercise regimen and they'll say that they walk up and down stairs frequently at home or they work in the yard all great things and better than a sedentary lifestyle, but I think the point being that we really want to convey how important it is to have a dedicated regimen. So when we look at, again, we're just talking about the, the general population right now. When we look at the most recent guidelines in 2019, the ACC, uh, American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association Cardiovascular um, Disease Primary Prevention Guidelines, the the first point they make is that adults should be routinely counseled in healthcare visits to optimize a physically active lifestyle. The second is adults should engage in at least 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity exercise or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity exercise. And we'll go through what that means for, for moderate intensity or vigorous intensity. And then it goes on to say that if you can't meet those guidelines, basically they'd be happy with any form of, of exercise. And resistance training is also encouraged as well. So in terms of what that means for moderate exercise, we measure it in terms of metabolic equivalence. And many of you may read a stress test on a patient and see you know, how many METs they were able to do on that stress test. So in terms of a moderate level of, of uh, exercise, anywhere from three to 5.9 METs. And that could be a brisk walk, 2.4 to four miles per hour, biking five to nine miles per hour, uh, ballroom dancing, recreational swimming. And many patients do the treadmill or stationary bike, so they in fact could measure um, how fast they're, they're exercising. And then in terms of vigorous, that would be greater than or equal to six METs. And that would be more the jogging, running, biking, um, swimming laps. And as we said before, unfortunately, only 50% of the adults in the United States exercise. And we haven't done a great job with this if we look at the trends from 2011 to 2019. So just talking about this in the general population, never mind when we switch gears to general heart disease and how important it is and what work we have to do in that population as well. These are just initiatives in the community, really trying to you know, emphasize the importance of exercise even with the NFL, CDC, um, and Department of Health and Human Services, everybody really trying to promote the importance of exercise. So as we um, transition to now congenital heart disease, we have the background of um, what, it, what the general recommendations would be and how, now how special this population of patients will be with congenital heart disease. So I'll start with the simple question of what is congenital heart disease? Congenital heart disease is a problem with the heart that or heart structure that's present at birth. And approximately one in 100 births um, is affected. 
And common defects could include a hole in the heart or misplaced malformed or missing heart valves, vessels, or heart chambers. So quite a variety in terms of spectrum of disease and variability within each defect as well. And some defects involve a combination of problems. It may not just be one problem. And you know, when these patients reach adulthood, we also have to appreciate the fact that they've had a lifelong um, history of, of medical appointments, operations, testing, um, procedures by the time they get to us. So we have to also consider that as well when we're trying to really emphasize um, exercise. And historically, our patients were, were advised not to participate in competitive sports. And I think a lot of that came early on from just a lack of understanding with these patients and, and, and how to, to guide them um, in sports, but then they carried over into recreational sports as well. But over time, we've, we've really learned that exercise um, is beneficial in this group. And not only that, not only from the congenital heart disease perspective, but they're living longer, which is great. Um, and then it will transition to that primary prevention of cardiovascular disease that we talked about in the very, very beginning. So just for an example, if we were to talk about one of the conditions of congenital heart disease, I just wanted to talk about, say, for example, an atrial septal defect. Um, so on the left, um, this, oh, good, yeah, I think you can see my little pointer. On the left is the normal heart and just some basic uh, review of, of anatomy and physiology. The right, si the right side of the heart here is deoxygenated blood. That's why we, we have it blue in the picture. And this is blood that's already returned from the body um, from the superior vena chain cava, inferior vena cava, goes to the right atrium, right ventricle, and goes um, from the pulmonary artery to the lungs to then release carbon dioxide, bring back fresh oxygen to the now the left side of the heart. So now we have freshly oxygenated blood coming back from the pulmonary vein, goes into the left atrium, left ventricle, now out to the body through the aorta to now pump through to the organs and skeletal muscles and rest of the body. So on the right, we have what's an atrial septal defect. So basically this is a communication between the top two chambers of the heart and you'll have abnormal blood flow coming from the left atrium to the right atrium. And the blood typically flows in that pattern because the left, uh, the left side, the left heart is a higher pressured system. So you have a bit of mixing of blood and, and this hole could be anywhere from this very tiny hole that we just monitor over time and the patient may never need anything done or it may be moderately large that we really have to keep an eye on that right-sided heart function to make sure that the right side doesn't enlarge um, or become thickened over time and maybe the function would decrease or get to that point that it has to be closed percutaneously in the cath lab. So it could be a catheter-based procedure or surgically, so open heart surgery. And then this condition is actually one of the most common forms of cyanotic heart disease, which is um, mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. This is Tetralogy of Fallot. Again, on the left is the normal heart, and on the right is a representation of a heart that has Tetralogy of Fallot. And this is one that encompasses several different physiolog physiologic changes within the heart. You start by having a narrowed pulmonary um, pulmonic valve, uh, which I'm pointing to right here. So on the left, this is kind of more of a normal pulmonic valve and this is um, narrowed. And it can also sometimes go up and affect, affect the branch um, arteries, pulmonic arteries. Um, you have a communication between now the bottom two, I'm sorry, the bottom two chambers of the heart, um, which is a ventricular septal defect or VSD. You have a uh, mixing now of, of blood, of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood there. And then the, the aorta is what we call an overriding aorta. And it's kind of comes down and hovers between the right ventricle and the left ventricle. So again, so now you're gonna have mixing of blood that's coming out and being delivered to the body. Uh, so blood that's not fully um, oxygenated. So these patients, the Tetralogy of Fallot patients, we'll see in a, in a later patient example, 
they've over time, by the time they reach adulthood, have had a lot of different um, procedures, surgeries. Usually there's some, some palliative uh, surgery early on, then, then a complete repair. And then over time, we have to watch that pulmonic valve because um, from being enlarged when they're younger, they're prone to have it be leaky um, over time. So when we look at how these patients have been studied and, and what we've learned and, and how we can evaluate their exercise capacity. One test that's actually been quite helpful to our population is a cardiopulmonary exercise test, also called CPET. So this study looked at 335 ACH, ACHD patients. And what they learned was that these patients have an overall decreased exercise capacity. And even uh, more important that the patients may not even have symptoms and they have quite a decreased exercise capacity. Peak VO2 is a measure um, that we look at on CPAT and they found that this was a reliable measure of exercise intolerance. And they also found differences in peak VO2 across the ACHD spectrum. So um, across the different um, syndromes and defects of ACHD. For example, ASD versus Tetralogy of Fallot. And why this is so important is because otherwise we'd be comparing these patients to the general population um, you know, by age, which kind of is an unfair comparison. Uh, and one other thing that came out of this study was that patients that had a peak VO2 of less than 15.5 uh, milliliters per kilogram per minute demonstrated an increased risk of hospital admission or death over the next mm -hmm. two years compared to patients who had a peak VO2 greater than 15.5. So this is a very helpful prognostic piece for us when we're trying to determine treatment plans. And just to highlight, I know this is a very busy slide, but looking at the patients who had that lower peak VO2, uh, many of these patients were sicker. They had class, more class three heart failure. They more, were more um, cyanotic in terms of what their, their congenital heart disease did encompass. A lot of them had um, more pulmonary artery hypertension, which is another higher risk uh, feature of congenital heart disease. And this is what they came up with, which again is very helpful. So if we talk about Tetralogy of Fallot, for example, which we just um, reviewed in the prior slides, their peak VO2 um, on average might be around 25. And um, on the left is um, the, the lower peak VO2 goes along with more of the complex congenital heart disease defects like Eisenmenger syndromes. And this is another study that studied um, a larger group of patients, but had very similar results. And this is data that um, was reviewed from 4,415 patients at a London hospital, as well as a PubMed search. And they again supported the, um, ex that exercise capacity does, does differ significantly across ACHD. They also did find some differences between genders as well. And when we compare those numbers, so remember we said that for Tetralogy of Fallot, um, peak VO2 may be around 25, just to, to put it into perspective what the healthier population looks at. For example, here's three athletes. I, um, I just randomly chose Joan Benoit Samuelson who's an Olympic runner um, with her peak VO2, Michael Phelps, who's one of the most decorated swimmers, um, male swimmers, his peak VO2 is 76, and David Beckham, soccer player, 67.6, so pretty much off the charts um, for those uh, folks. So what, what happens in a cardiopulmonary exercise test? So just as the uh, title of the test tells you, it provides us information about the heart, the lungs, and muscles in response to exercise. So as I described to patients, it's a very fancy stress test. Um, so we're going to get information on exercise capacity, which we describe as the, as the peak um, VO2 or sometimes VO2 max. And it's the amount of body your oxygen can consume during exercise. And as said earlier, it also helps us to give us, gives us information about exercise capacity and more prognostic um, indicators to help guide treatment plans. And I included the 
um, formula that goes into how uh, a peak VO2 is calculated. And we're not gonna get into all of this today, but just to highlight that um, within this formula, why it's so helpful in our patients, because um, it, you multiply the heart rate by the stroke volume and then the arterial and venous content of the blood as well. And so we're looking at many of our patients are on so many medications, so their heart rate may be low or they have something called chronotropic incompetence where they can't melt the normal response um, to the test. Um, diminished stroke volume may be in our more um, uh, advanced patients who have uh, LV dysfunction, uh, left ventricular dysfunction, um, and shunt lesions as well. So if the arterial content in the oxygen is affected uh, with some of um, the shunting lesions. So really you can get a lot of information. And we do know that the peak VO2 is reduced in these patients. So this is um, what a cardiopulmonary um, exercise test looks like. This is what we would call a level one, which is what we're talking about today. There's various levels of tests. Um, some of the, the more advanced tests, patients actually go into the cath lab and have invasive monitoring during the test. But for what we're talking about today, this is what we would um, be looking at. So on the left is a treadmill test, and you could see that um, included in this is blood pressure monitoring, EKG monitoring, as well as um, a mask for gas exchange to, to measure. And on the right is um, a bicycle test. And when we look at how, when we try to come up with programs for, um, for these patients in terms of how long and what they should do for exercise, um, at early uh, 2015, we had a, some, uh, a task force in terms of coming up with um, recommendations. There wasn't really clear guidelines as of yet. So this was the American uh, Heart Association and American College of Cardiology that came out with some uh, like I said, some recommendations that basically say that uh, physical activity is definitely better than a sedentary lifestyle. And they recommended some testing that may help uh, to, to, to guide patients and create a program. They talk about some non-invasive testing, which I highlighted here, Holter monitor echo, cardiac MRI, which we use often in our patients, um, and just saying that this may actually be, be quite useful. And then they also talk about, um, which is important, um, the, the dynamic component to exercise in the static component. So when we think about the static component, we're thinking of the isometrics, those um, exercises that might um, more rapidly increase um, blood pressure uh, because of the resistance involved in them. So, you know, but again, kind of more recommendations, not clear guidelines as of yet. And then in 2018, we do have some guidelines that, that now came out because these are the most recent guidelines for congenital heart disease put out by the AHA and the ACC. And what they say is that clinicians should assess activity levels at regular intervals and counsel patients on the types and intensity of exercise appropriate to their clinical status. Uh, very important because we're starting to get away from classifying them by their disease. We're trying to get into a more functional evaluation of uh, where they're at and, and what's appropriate for their exercise levels. And number two is using a CPAT to help guide activity recommendations for these patients. And also cardiac rehab can be useful to help increase exercise capacity because um, we do have a, another study that had shown um, it's a very small sample, but uh, patients who had a dedicated program did show improvement in their in their peak VO2. But again, you know, great in terms of using the CPAT and helping patients. But really, how do we still go about in these patients who have um, such variability within um, within each defect? Um, how do we go about de developing this program? So the European Heart Journal made some recommendations. Um, on how to do this. And it, it talked about five parameters. The first being ventricular structure and function. Second, looking at pulmonary artery pressures. Third, aorta. Fourth, arrhythmias. And five, oxygen saturation. In terms of how we monitor this, these are all tests that we usually um, use and obtain routinely in our patients. So for example, 
looking at ventricular function, usually we have routine echocardiograms or heart ultrasound on our patients or cardiac MRI is also very useful. Pulmonary artery pressures can also be obtained on echocardiograms. On some occasions, um, we're unable to, to measure that. If there were true concern, um, you know, a direct measurement in the cath lab for a right heart cath is possible. Looking at the aortic size, and that's again by echocardiography or cardiac MRI. Assessment of arrhythmias, because our population of patients are at higher risk for arrhythmias. But we always start with a 12 lead EKG, looking at their, their rhythm, looking at intervals, any prolongation. Any concern, we can also go to a, maybe like a 24 or 40 hour Holter or a Zeo monitor for seven or 14 days. And then pulse oximetry, we always, um, in many of our patients check uh, pulse oximetry and do a walk test in the office. And this is what I found out of anything I, I was most excited about when I was reviewing for this talk was that the European Society of Cardiology have these guidelines that were just put out in 2020 that using those five parameters give us this very, very helpful flow diagram as to how to sit down, you know, patient specific, go through and come up with if you look at the very bottom of the chart, um, a exercise regimen that can really be geared on the intensity of their exercise, what type of exercise they want to do based on how, you know, the static com component of the exercise and give them very clear heart rate guidelines. And then this just also, I don't have to go through this in detail, talks about the class and the level of recommendation for this. So. Let's walk through now um, a patient scenario and see how we would use that, um, that flow diagram to, to sit down and, and create a program. So I'm gonna talk about TL. He's a 33 year old male that we've followed and he has a history of congenital pulmonic stenosis. So what that means is if you pull down and look at the, the pictures here, on the left is the normal heart. On the right, he was born with a very narrowed pulmonic valve. Um, so not much blood you know, able to flow through that valve. And so at the age of three, he had what was an open surgical valvotomy. So he had open heart surgery to expand that valve. And over time, he's now left with a leaky valve. And because of that, because when you have a leaky pulmonic valve, that blood leaks back into the right ventricle. So the risk is that that right ventricle will enlarge and the function will be decreased. And he does in fact have that. He has um, a leaky valve with mildly decreased function. And so when we um, have seen him in the office and we'll go through his recent testing, he's somebody who has always done aerobic exercise, 20 to 30 minutes on a treadmill or stationary bike. He um, lifts weights, knows to avoid heavy lifting, and he has always denied any symptoms follows a really heart healthy appropriate diet. And if we review his testing, we'll talk about the testing that we did first in 2017. So he had a cardiac MRI that does in fact show that his right ventricle is enlarged or dilated. And that just talks about the volumes of 129 cc's per meter square. And his right ventricle is mildly impaired with a right ventricular ejection fraction of 37%. At that point, he had a moderately leaky pulmonic valve or um, what we call pulmonic regurgitation. And his regurgitant fraction, which is how much blood is leaking back, is, is 42%. Did not have any more narrowing, which we call pulmonic stenosis. And his CPAT at that time showed that he had a peak VO2 of about 24.2, so moderately reduced exercise capacity. If we fast forward to his most recent recent testing, which is 2020, again, he was asymptomatic through all through over all of these years. His right ventricular dilation was about the same. His um, right ventricular ejection fraction about the same. At this point, he now has severe pulmonic regurgitation where his regurgitant fraction is now 48%. So when we did a CPAT, we learned that his peak VO2 actually improved a little bit. He is now 25.9. So very helpful because in this setting where um, the only thing that had changed was a severe pulmonic regurgitation, if his uh, peak VO2 started to really decline, that may have been a, uh, an intervention time for us. Like we may have thought, what do we need to do to help that 
that pulmonic valve and intervene. But because his peak VO2 is so stable, we decided we would just um, continue to monitor him. And this is just an example of, of some of the information. We get a lot of information on these cardiopulmonary exercise tests. And again, it breaks it down. Exercise capacity, cardiovascular performance, the EKG, uh, pulmonary performance. And what I was just putting this in there for is um, because we do see that his peak VO2 is 25.9. Um, 7.4 METs, so a pretty good workload. And what his peak heart rate was. His peak heart rate was 185 beats per minute. And uh, I was gonna skip this slide, but this goes back to you know, the, those task force recommendations in 2015 were a little bit loose in terms of, you know, they would have said uh, for number four athletes with severe PR, you know, um, can consider low intensity class 1A, 1B, but really nothing um, structured and um, kind of patient specific based. But if we bring back that diagram that I was so excited about, we could now kind of plug in his, um, his testing. So we can say that, yes, we know that he has some right ventricular dysfunction because he's dilated. We know that he has normal pulmonary artery pressures. We know that his aorta is uh, normal and that he has never had any issues with arrhythmias. He's not cyanotic. So we can now say that when we have at least one in the orange category, um, that he could either do um, moderate um, static exercise um, that he could do at high intensity, um, or he might do a high static intensity, a high static um, exercise, sorry, at moderate intensity. So really an opportunity for us to sit down with him, and this is my goal with our program, to say what, what is it that you would like to do and, and how can we get that get you there and guide you. Um, so almost be like their, their coach to, um, to get to help with this exercise program for them. And what we need to do is ask them, you know, this, let's establish the frequency of the exercise you're going to do, um, duration, intensity, and type. So if we were to say with this patient, okay, if you want to do more moderate static, um, high intensity exercise, based on that flow diagram, we can get very specific and say, your training heart rate should be 75 to 90% of your max heart rate during that CPAP, which for him was 185 beats per minute. So we can say, you know, your training heart rate should be about 138 to 166 beats per minute. If we wanted to kind of do the opposite and say the high static, moderate intensity exercise, um, then we would lower his uh, training heart rate to 60 to 75% and just say that your, your training goal heart rate would now be 111 to 138. So um, if I'm going to switch gears a little bit now, I'm going to talk about this uh, patient in terms of kind of how prognostically it helped us in terms of his CPAT and symptoms. So this is BM, and he's a 52-year-old male who has tetralogy of flow. And just to outline, as we talked about earlier, a lifelong history of surgeries and testing and intervention. Um, he had a palliative um, repair at 13 months for his tetralogy and then a complete repair at age eight. And he needed revision of his pulmonary artery branch at age 25 because it was narrowed or stenotic. And ultimately underwent a pulmonic valve replacement at the age of 38. And he has been pretty active walking two miles daily without symptoms. And now looking back, you know, what I would have liked to have um, is exactly what intensity he was exercising at, because that's something that, you know, we had not asked. And his testing was more over time, whereas the prior patient, we had a cardiac MRI with the CPAT that we could compare to um, again. This patient, it was a little bit more difficult to come, to come in for testing, so it was a bit scattered. So his CPAT was in 2018, and we can see here that his peak VO2 is quite low at 17.4, remembering that when we looked at that, um, that prior chart that our peak VO2 for a tetralogy patients around 25. Um, he had a ZEO monitor in 2019, which is a monitor for heart rhythm. 
uh, potential for heart rhythm disorders, and he did have 10 episodes of ventricular tachycardia. He had two episodes of super ventricular tachycardia. He also had a cardiac MRI that showed he had uh, normal left ventricular heart uh, function and size. His right ventricular um, function was normal, but the right ventricle was a bit enlarged. And we know that his valve was, um, was narrowed in regurgitant, so leaky again. And his regurgitant fraction was a bit more variable than the, the prior patient, anywhere from 31% to 41%. His most recent echocardiogram showed um, very similar findings, um, normal left ventricular heart size and function, a dilated right ventricle with um, kind of low normal function. He didn't have any residual shunting from his, his prior repair of, of the tetralogy of Fallot. His valve um, now had some elevated gradients um, and still was regurgitant, but he now endorsed symptoms. Um, and that was kind of the game changer here for us. So after reviewing all his studies, knowing he had a, a peak VO2 that was quite low, he actually very recently underwent a transcatheter pulmonic valve replacement um, and was just discharged and doing well. So we'll see him back in the office. And then, you know, at some point we'll get another CPAT and now can sit down, go through his parameters and see what, what type of structured program can we recommend to him. And now so many patients do have, um, you know, iPhones and apps, you know, you can actually measure peak VO2, not that we want them getting too involved in, in, um, in overwhelmed. Uh, we still want this to be something that they enjoy, but very helpful for feedback. Again, if we could be kind of their coach to get them to uh, be in a really good place with a, a structured program um, that they're doing on a, on a regular basis. Um, like I said, there's, there's many ways that they can, they can do this and, and give us feedback in terms of how it's going. There are plenty of athletes out there that have to trial it, that have, um, congenital heart disease at the Olympic level, um, and Super Bowl level. We don't need all of our patients to be Olympians or, or Super Bowl champs, but we really just want to convey that, you know, we're committed to them and, uh, to, to really developing this part of our program. So in terms of, again, my goals and in, in, in our program goals, we really need to do a good job of asking every patient what they're doing for exercise and really getting, and really getting specific. And that's what I've learned over time. You know, if you're walking your dog, is that really a casual pace? Like, are you able to, to carry on a conversation? If you're able to converse during walking or running, it's usually more of a moderate level activity. Um, Real, be routine with obtaining um, the echocardiogram or MRI, the EKG, oxygen levels, have all that data so that when we send our patients for a CPAT, then we can sit down and say, okay, let's go through that, um, that flow diagram and see where you fall and what you would like to do and how can we get you there. Um, and remind them, and as I remind, you know, my kids and, and, and all our patients, the heart's a muscle and like all muscles, it really wants to stay as fit as it can. It may not be normal heart and, and what's going where and how the blood's flowing, but um, you know, from what we, we've learned, we still can get them to exercise safely. And lastly, I would love to thank the program. I'm um, so grateful to work with such an incredible team that has taught me so much over the last six years. Um, Dr. Bott, Dr. Safari Aye, Dr. Learn, Lauren McLaughlin, Linda, and Vanessa. So thank you all. Um, so, um, so that's the end. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for the opportunity to, to talk to all of you and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Sharon. It was a wonderful presentation. Um, so as she mentioned, we are wrapping up and getting towards the end. So if anyone has any questions for Sharon, please feel free to drop them in the chat and we will continue on with a little Q&A session if um, people have questions. And so we actually have a question already. So um, Sharon, someone asks, should I ask my cardiologist about an exercise program that is best for me as a CHD patient. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that as we're coming into 
you know, having more um, structured guidelines, I feel like we can do a better job of getting patients, like instead of like, like I said, when I first started working with these patients, I'd be like, oh, do you exercise? What do you do? Okay, great. You know, how long? But now I know how to get more specific. So, um, and again, like, I think if we just take, like, I'm so passionate about this with our patients, I, I want to, you know, convey my enthusiasm to them and, and how we can get them there. So for them to initiate the discussion, that would be fantastic. Wonderful. And a follow-up question to that. Um, the question is, what if I have other physical limitations, such as knee problems, and how best can someone exercise their heart? So then we see if, you know, there's so many different things we can try to, um, to work on. Um, like if they had access to a pool, if they're a swimmer, or does biking affect their knee? Um, you know, I we do have a lot of patients that do have like back problems and other arthritic conditions. So we really do try to work with them, which goes into the whole like, you know, what type of exercise can and do, can you do? Do you want to do? And how can we how can we have you exercise safely in that in, in that um, with that type of exercise? Perfect. And do you work with any patients virtually? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. And which is actually funny because that's the, since since COVID, that's um, kind of been my goal is to to help this to try try to do more of like virtual visits for this part of the program because there's a lot that we can do if all the testing is obtained. Then sit down and talk. We can do that virtually. Yeah. Wonderful. And another question we have. So on extremely hot days, such as today, what kind of exercises do you recommend for CHD patients? So that's another great question. If, if you can do it in the early morning or later hours, uh, for sure, just because um, otherwise, um, it, you know, when you exercise in these, in these conditions, sometimes your, your blood vessels will, will dilate more um, just to try to deal with the release of heat. So you, you could be prone to, um, you know, maybe your pressure being a little lower or, you know, overall not, not feeling as well. So um, either try to do it during the off time, or if there's, if it's a, like an indoor, like treadmill that you do or something for that day, it might be a better option because this is extremely hot. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And another question. So this person asks, my teenage CHD patient wants to play high school sports. Is this okay? And should they consult their cardiologist first? Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Consult the cardiologist first. Um, again, depending on um, what their disease is within within the congenital heart disease spectrum, because there's you know such a large spectrum and, a, and such a such variability within each um which de each defect, so absolutely. Perfect, and do you, what is your opinion on brisk walking as an exercise, is it effective? Absolutely, because um, that actually can be considered depending on and how brisk, like I said, it, like on the treadmill, we could get like a good miles per hour. Um, so it could be considered vigorous, definitely moderate intensity um, or vigorous for sure, yeah. Thank you. And who knew at the Olympics, they, they do have race walking. I do. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so there's potential. Yeah, anyone can do it. Yeah. All right. So if anyone has any last minute questions, still feel free to put them in the chat. These are great questions. Yep. Thank you, everyone. I'm, again, I'm so excited to, to be here. I'll give it a few, um, a few more moments, see if any last ones come, come in. So it looks like questions have kind of slowed down. So we, I think we'll end a little bit early. Um, if you have any final uh, thoughts, Sharon, on your presentation that you want to end off with? No, I think that, you know, um, like I said, like I started off in the general population and then now with congenital heart disease exercise, like I can't like convey enough how important it is in, in all aspects of, of, of caring for our patients. So, um, you know, I know it's not easy. Uh, you really have to set aside time and, um, but uh, yeah, so we, we, our goal is to really uh, develop 
a program to, to help our congenital heart disease patients with this. So definitely. Well, thank you again, Sharon, for the wonderful presentation. This was great information. So we're going to end today's program, but I hope that everyone found the presentation helpful and everyone has a great day. Thank you again, Sharon. Thank you, Amy. Thanks everybody. I appreciate it.